Ladies and gentlemen, a special interview now with Philip Mills, founder and executive director of Les Mills. Les Mills need no introduction. They are one of our industry's most revered household names. They've been incredibly active over the past 50 years, especially when it comes to group fitness. But in the recent years, they've managed to build some quite fantastic digital content with their on-demand and, of course, growing their base, not just of gyms and bricks and mortar businesses in New Zealand, but much more globally with one of the most cult-like followings for trainers and educators anywhere in the world. It's truly a legacy brand, an absolute empire of a company. And we couldn't be more prouder of what Philip and his team have done and advocated and championed for our industry over these past 50 years. Philip has just been named our Lifetime Achievement Award winner as well for 2021 in his 50th year in industry. Congratulations to Philip. A quick thank you now from our sponsors, and then Philip and I will get into another great interview. Let's look at the here and the now, Philip. Of course, these last 12 months have been very challenging for a lot of countries, a lot of operators, a lot of individuals. They've, they've had sacrifices and, and they've had losses across the way. Although there are green shoots of recovery happening, there are still some very challenging times ahead. Let's look at this business, though, at the moment in time. You know, what we've been focused on is COVID. We've been focused on safety. We've been focused on hygiene. Have we really forgot some of the fundamentals, the basics about the health and fitness industry and, and why we're in it? Uh, I suspect so. Uh, look, I think it is necessary to acknowledge that we're not out of this yet. This is tough. Even in New Zealand, we've been very, very lucky that our government supported the fitness industry and did let us open fully without very heavy restrictions. But uh, even in New Zealand, you know, we're... We have done well with COVID. We haven't had much of it uh, other than that first three months last year when we were locked down and it was very tough as it was for everybody in the world. Uh, But what sort of tended to happen is we would start to get close to our previous membership and then we'd have another little lockdown um, a week or three weeks or something like that. So even in New Zealand, it's been tough. We're coming in and out of it. Uh, What we see is that pretty quickly people do move on from the extreme focus on safety as soon as we're allowed to. Basically, as soon as you're COVID-free, then we do start moving back to the fundamentals. But I do think that it's important that we realise that the industry, the traditional industry, was under stress before COVID came along. Really, the boutiques were, 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 you know, they were killing us at a big part of the business. The budgets obviously were. Um, the budgets have been getting better and better and better at what they do and sort of merging towards the middle with all sorts of different models um, and multi-tiered pricing models and things like that. So 
I'm really impressed with what the, the budgets have done. And I think where the traditional clubs have improved and offered more and more value than people have tended to migrate from the budgets to those. But I think that we've got another whole major step of migration to go through to, to do as well as what the boutiques were doing. The boutiques have shown us that people will, they highly value when we do the, the things well um, that, that, you know, that they're paying big amounts of money for. And there's a big lesson in that. And I, I think that traditional clubs can't forget that. You know, we, we were just starting to make that migration before COVID and we've really got to keep our foot to the pedal on that. You know, if, if we don't, then uh, we, will, we will age. Our clubs are aging and we've started putting boutiques into them and, you know, it makes a huge difference. We, you've got to get the young people when they're joining, joining for their first time. If you can get them when they join for their first time, there's a good chance that you'll have them for the rest of their lives. On and off, you know, they'll come and they'll go. Um, we, we get people that have joined a half a dozen a dozen times on and off throughout their lives and they come back to you and you talk to them in the clubs. Um, but you do have to get the young people. That is, you know, as, as most of our data shows, that's when, when people join is in that sort of mid-20s uh, age group and, and we've, we've got to get those. And to do that, you've, we've got to look at what the boutiques have been doing, what the best boutiques have been doing, and we have to bring that into the traditional industry. Let's focus in on group fitness and group exercise, Philip. Like you said just there, the boutiques have really innovated this space and alongside traditional gyms, group exercise has never been bigger in terms of an offering out to the consumer place. Of course, COVID has meant things a little bit differently when it comes to safe distancing, uh, touch in, touch out, the programming, et cetera, has all had to change as a result of COVID. Have the fundamentals of group exercise changed? Will the positioning of group exercise change? Or will it just simply find a new natural to move forward on? Oh, I think once we're out of COVID, it's going to go back to the same drivers that it had before. As you say, the boutiques have been doing this fabulously well. They've had fantastic uh, teachers, they've had fantastic programming, you know, fun, exciting program. They've had created great environments. And these are the things that we have to do, that we have to move, keep moving forward on in the, in the clubs, you know, we, that we were getting a little bit tired on. Uh, we, again, you know, a lot of people out there have probably heard me say that we're as much in the motivation business as we are in the exercise business. And uh, because people can, you know, they can exercise at home in the living room or running around at the block, at the block or at their local park. And, and they don't because they, they lack the motivation. So this is one of the really big things that we do that group exercise does, that good group exercise does really well. Uh, and there, there are lots of other things, you know, that, that, that motivate people in clubs. I, I, it's a lot about the staff, about having friendly staff, but it's, you know, it's about the social environment. People will come back um, for, because we're social animals, they, we desperately want to commune with other people and people will come back for that uh, reason alone and we have to enhance that. But your personal trainers, the, you know, keeping your decor modern, being a cool third place to be, all, all of those sorts of things, music, um, audio visual, uh, things that, that make a club an exciting place to be are important. But, you know, what you get in group fitness is you get the motivation of music, of crowd energy, of a really, when it's done well, a fantastic teacher up the front who builds a big following of people, you know, like a rock star. Um, all of those kind of things we, we have to focus on. And, um, and I, you know, it, it is fundamental. I think look at it through that motivational lens. But um, there are a bunch of fundamentals around doing it well. One is getting the right metrics. Um, the key metric is attendance. You know, you've got to measure the quality of your classes on attendance. You've got to measure the quality of the job that you're doing in your club based on the average number of times that a person attends per week. And if they're attending once a week, it's not good enough. You are going to lose them within 12 months. If they're attending, you know, two times a week, it makes a gigantic difference. They will probably stay for five years. You know, once you get out to sort of to three, four, five times a week, you're going to keep them for forever. Um, and uh, and create a lot of uh, of referrals in in the process. So um, 
measure that, you know, attendance is a really key metric. Hiring fantastic staff and training fantastic staff and group exercise is really crucial. Uh, creating, um, yeah, motivating them, uh, creating a fantastic group fitness environment, bringing that into your marketing, how you do all of that stuff. Uh, I, I, I don't... Uh, I don't want to be plugging what we're doing, but I highly recommend that people do our group fitness management module. It is a generic module that teaches you the, the fundamentals, the fundamental things that you need to do, like how to keep good metrics, how to recruit good teachers. This, you know, irrelevant of whether you're working with us or not, these are principles that, that are important and apply and will help you to do really well with your group fitness. So, do do go and do the group fitness management uh, um, course. It's all online, of course, as everything is, and there's there's no obligation whatsoever to uh, to do business with us. It's just something we've evolved over the last sort of twenty or thirty years, and I think that there is a lot of good um, good learning in there that'll help you to do really well out of group fitness. I think many people will uh, warmly accept that invitation, Philip. Anything they can do to improve the skill sets behind their group programming, their group planning uh, would only benefit them and their company. Let's look at the silver lining of COVID, which perhaps has been how group exercise and fitness has been innovated. We've saw live streaming classes coming out from a whole number of operators. We've saw on-demand libraries being built. We've even got in-club virtual only offerings now, Philip. I mean, quite incredible to see the number of mediums and platforms that Group X has now been um, delivered upon. What are your thoughts in terms of how we can grow each of these, let's call them silos, but how do we grow each of these silos and how do we make sure like Les Mills is doing already, that there is maybe a more comprehensive solution that people can get access to? Uh, yeah, look, I, I think you're, you're right. We have innovated. We've been forced to innovate and to move forward in this area. It was really happening in a big way pre-COVID. Uh, people, our research showed that 82, 83% of people who belong to clubs are working out at home as well. Uh, and something like 62, 63% of those were doing online fitness. So it was something that was there before, but I think we pretty much abdicated it to the big Instagram stars and people. And, uh, and I don't think we're going to afford to do that. I don't think we're going to afford to abdicate this to Peloton and to Apple, uh, et cetera. I, I think that we do have to take control of it ourselves. Uh, I think the thing is that content is very, very important. And I think that's underrated. I think we do have to focus on, because again, it's about motivation. Uh, we've got to do this well. You know, we've got to create great quality video and, uh, and have great teachers uh, giving really entertaining sessions when we're doing live stream, uh, all of those things. Uh, I, I think that it's, that it's this ecosystem uh, is something that we should try and, and keep some control of ourselves. Um, but I, I, yeah, because this is what our members are doing. This is the reality of it. They're ex exercising at home already, and, uh, and we really want to try and keep them inside our ecosystem. Absolutely, I think that, that live is king. I think that people are going to come back, but we've got to remember, again, that people were doing this a lot pre-COVID, and that's about convenience, really. Uh, we know that one of the main reasons that people join a club is because it's convenient, because it's near me, it's, it's easy to, to access, um, and some days we're just too busy to get into the club and we're going to do it at home. Even me, I'm going to do some classes at home. The club is, is absolutely the key. And the more motivating and more social we can make it, then the more people are going to come back. And people are paying a lot more to go to clubs than they are to do this stuff online. Um, but we do have to do it online. And I think, again, that it is important that we control it. The key to it, again, is doing it well. I think that there are too many people maybe jumping into this because they going to be the next Peloton. Uh, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that, that Peloton is, is a unique event. Uh, of course, you know, what, one of the things that works for them is that you, if you don't pay your $40 a month, you've got a very expenditure sitting in your living room. And I'm not sure that it's going to happen anyway. I just think that the, comp, the content game uh, is getting, you know, very, very, competitive in that sense. There are so many connected de devices that people are launching. I think that it's going to be a, a tough game. And I do think that there is a whole lot of headroom 
in the live industry if we do it well. It's been growing, growing, growing over the last 50 years, and it's become the biggest adult sport in the world. As, as some of you have heard me say, uh, our research shows in terms of the number of hours that people spend exercising a week, um, more, people, more adults are going to gyms than all other sports combined, all other team sports and individual sports combined. We are a huge industry, and I see the big sociological drivers of that continuing, uh, and I think that we will continue to grow as long as we do it well, as long as we do a good job. We've seen operators have to embrace technology like never before, Philip. Uh, Les Mills have been early adopters of technology. And of course, you have platforms and solutions that really are driving new value into these operators. What are your thoughts on technology in terms of is it a driver? Is it an enabler? Is it the future of the business? There has to be a balance. How have you balanced technology in your business? And where do you think operators can best balance technology in their business? Sure. We've adopted some aspects of technology in our business. Again, we look at it primarily through a motivational lens. And so some aspects of technology, like having big screen virtuals, you know, really big, nice screen virtual, um, really moving into immersive, moving into stuff like the trip. And we will go further down that track with building studios, with, with CGX technology in there. So stuff that is exertainment stuff that does motivate people is important. Uh, I have a little bit of a contrarian view on, um, on some of the devices in the industry. I, most people, I, I'm sorry if anybody is, is in that business, but most people who I know kind of seem to get sick of their, their, their watch or their, their ring or whatever the other device is, you know, after a month or so. Um, I think that they, that stuff, uh, is motivational for a little while uh, in terms of getting yourself to hit your goals. But after a while, you sort of learn how much exercise you need. And uh, I think it's, it becomes a tyranny. I think it takes you into left brain. It takes you out of your, your, your right brain, creative sort of um, spontaneous enjoyment space. And it takes you into left brain analytical where you're really watching the numbers. And I don't think that that's a motivational way. So uh, for me, that's a part of technology that I don't think has uh, as, as bigger plays as big a part in the future as, as people perhaps think. But uh, you know, hopefully, I'll be be proven wrong. I do see sort of expressions of that. I see some people loving the competitive side of it. Uh, probably the majority of people not, just wanting to enjoy and be social and be motivated. But I do see certainly a percentage of people who love to get very competitive about stuff. And so we've got to embrace sort of uh, both markets. Um, and in terms of technology, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on, uh, on digital marketing. There's a lot of ways that, uh, that, that digital uh, makes, it, makes it less expensive for us to run our businesses. And that will continue to be the case in the future. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I remember maybe the last few months over COVID, I was actually doing a lot of running uh, up and down the beach, Philip, and I was trying to always do personal best or stick in that zone of, you know, near 100% um, effort and performance. And what I realized quite quickly was it, the technology was driving me to do something that was building my performance, but not necessarily building a great experience. I wasn't quite as enjoying it. So I took off uh, that equipment. Actually, I just ran. And I think I looked at some of the timings afterwards. I was probably running about 5 to 10% less quicker than I would be normally with, with the metrics on, but I was enjoying it 10 times more because my mind wasn't stuck in the technology. It was just stuck on enjoying the experience uh, around me. Yeah, we've got to be careful with that. We don't want to build an aversion to exercise in people. A big part of this game uh, is getting people to fall in love with exercise. Um, that's the, the quote that from my dad in 1968, the job of the fitness industry is to help people fall in love with exercise. And I think that that's a very important principle to keep in mind. Now, let's look at one of the, the best experiences in town, which is Les Mills Live. Um, you know, a cornerstone to your entire, in, uh, your entire network, uh, Philip. And I think every single trainer, every single club member that wants to become in part of that has always enjoyed an incredible experience. I know it's not possible just now in COVID, but um, are you planning Les Mills Live again after COVID? What, what are we going to expect from that? Of course, yeah. We're hoping that by October we'll be able to start running those again. They're really important to us. They're a way that we motivate instructors, that we get them excited about 
keeping on teaching group fitness and about the new choreography and the new classes that we're bringing in. So, yeah, that motivational aspect is, uh, is really important to us. And we will be back full on with those as soon as we possibly can. Let's look a couple of last questions, Philip. Um, trends. There's big trends, there's small trends. Some will stick and some will fade. Inevitably, you know, I want to get your thoughts on where exactly you see trends sticking, where perhaps are they going to fade away, and perhaps some of the trends that are not out there just now that could start to hit home in the next couple of years. Sure. Look, um, it's very, very uh, you take a risk with this one, it's easy to, to turn out wrong. I, in the 80s, and I, I can't remember the name of the company, there was an American equipment company that was producing cardio equipment with games on it. And one of them, you, you had a stair climber and, uh, and you were dropping buckets of water on flying pigs and trying to knock them out of the water. You, you were flying a biplane. I think another one of them was a recumbent uh, cycle where you were, you were ski racing. And, uh, and I said, this, these guys, this is so much fun. These guys are going to be the biggest thing in the industry. And uh, look, I can't even remember their name now. They're gone. Um, I, would, I would still, though, um, 30-something years later, say that gamification is going to be big. I think that, um, that we are going to figure this out. Exercise games are not very good right now, what's, you know, what's been created in that space. But I think if the equipment companies can create that gamification uh, that that's it's about motivation. It's about making exercise fun. Uh, so I do look forward to seeing a lot of that. I I think that the CGX stuff again, the computer graphic stuff, is going to be, become bigger and bigger, creating immersive environments. Um, there's um, you know so there's some very boring group that fitness studios around the world um, that I hate to tell you. Um, this is, you know, to, to, to go into a tiny little room with bright lights on and great big mirrors in front of you uh, that feels like an operating theatre or, you know, a very, very self-conscious laboratory environment or something is not a way to motivate people. We need to, to make our clubs uh, just a, a wonderful, creative, motivational third place, a third space for people to be. So I think that those sort of trends are going to be are going to be great. I, I just constantly see equipment evolving and I, and I love that. And I see uh, new styles of classes coming along all the time and the boutiques, you know, what the boutiques are doing. Again, copy them, do what they're doing because they're doing great. Well, look, Philip, thank you for that inspirational message, inspirational thoughts. Uh, 53 years running, uh, my friend, and, um, you know, a, a very warmly welcomed winner for our Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021. Congratulations. We're uh, currying that uh, award down to you just now. But for those watching this, last night at the, at the awards, uh, Philip won a Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations, Philip, to you and the team uh, for all you do, for the inspiration you continue to give everybody the hope, um, the thought leadership. It really is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ross. Um, it's a great honour. And look, I thank all of you, my friends and colleagues out there who have together, we've created this wonderful industry that just does so much good in the world in all sorts of ways. It brings health and community and magic into people's lives. It's a wonderful thing that, that, that you guys are doing. And I just wish you all the very best with it. Hang in there. I take the weight on my shoulders